Good evening to everyone, and thank you for being here with us today. On behalf of the Mitty Institute of Liberal Arts, I, Akibad Mullah, student of the Liberal Arts, is pleased to welcome everyone for today's webinar lecture on receding Himalayan glaciers. Global climate change is a growing matter of concern for, for the human society today. It is not only impacting the ecosystem, but also impacts the socio political and economic surroundings in the contemporary global society. One of the emerging concerns in environmental and political discourse has been of melting Himalayan glaciers that is directly linked to the issues surrounding climate change. Today, we are delighted to have with us Dr. Mutukuma Mani, a lead economist in the South Asia Chief Economist Office to talk on this very topic. Dr. Mani has over 20 years of experience of heading environmental projects and policy dialogue, analytical work and capacity building activities. He primarily works on climate change mitigation and adaptation issues, water and environmental issues in the region. Prior to joining the South Asia region, he led the World Bank's work on assessing environmental implications of development policy lending reforms in the Environment Department of the World Bank. Prior to joining this position, Dr. Mani was an economist in the Fiscal Affairs Department of the International Monetary Fund, where he was responsible for analyzing environmental implications of macroeconomic policies and programs and in integrating environmental considerations broadly in the IMF country programs. Dr. Mani has numerous books, journal publications, and policy papers under his name. Now, I would like to invite Sir to deliver the lecture and address the session for the evening. Over to you, Sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, again, very nice to uh, come and speak in front of students. I don't get this opportunity very often. Uh, so what I will do is I will share my screen, uh, uh, a short presentation, and we can have a uh, question and answer after that. So today I'll be talking about uh, the glaciers of Himalayas. And, and, and first of all, I guess we need to understand why this uh, topic is so important. So I'm going to start, you, uh, start with a story here. Uh, so as you see here on the screen, this is uh, Kumik village. Uh, in the Zanskar Valley uh, in the Himalayas. And uh, this uh, is one of the oldest uh, communities uh, and one of the remotest communities uh, in this planet, you can say. And, and, and living uh, is to, and, and one of the longest surviving communities uh, living in these mountainous areas. Uh, but as you can see, there's nobody here anymore. People, of this village have left. And the reason being, they're, they're the main source of water uh, in which they survived for, for centuries used to come from glaciers. And those glaciers have receded. So now they did not have any water for their crops, for their uh, drinking purposes, and so on and so forth. So they had to leave this village and go somewhere else. So in some ways, the residents of Kumik village became climate refugees. But this is just not the story of Kumik, but also a number of other communities around South Asia region, which are facing uncertain consequences, economic consequences, because of glacier melt, uh, which has huge implications for their source of water, food, energy, and livelihoods. So there are hundreds and thousands of Kumiks all over the region that face an uncertain future because of climate change and glacier melt. In terms of water, South Asia region, as you all know, is one of the water, water scarce regions in the world, and it's continuously facing declining water avail availability. To some extent, one can say that this uh, Water scarcity was, is man-made because of inefficient use of water in terms of water allocation, water distribution, and water usage, uh, which has actually led to alarming groundwater depletion both in India and Pakistan, and also uh, water crisis in Afghanistan. So 
well, to some extent, climate change is responsible or, or in some ways making the water scarcity worse, but I think it's also to large extent a man-made problem. Natural disasters uh, is a, a major issue facing the region, and also some of it can be linked to the glaciers. For example, when the glaciers melt, they form uh, what are called as glacial lakes. And these glacial lakes, beyond a point, they tend to break ca and causing huge uh, uh, floods and landslides downstream and causing a huge economic uh, uh, damage downstream and also uh, leading to loss of uh, human lives. So we saw, we saw uh, the, the Uttarakhand disaster a few years ago, but something similar is bound to happen, especially as more and more glacial lakes are formed because of glacier melt, and then they tend to burst, and which in turn leads to will could lead to huge uh, human suffering. Uh, South Asia region, of course, depends a lot on on these rivers for their food, and, and clearly that's going to be affected, especially if the melting glaciers or retreat of glaciers is going to alter uh, the river flowing across the region. Uh, and, and that thereby impacting their irrigation systems and then affecting their agricultural productivity, food security, and so on and so forth. Uh, most of the countries in South Asia rely a lot on, on these uh, water resources for their energy needs, especially hydropower. And a lot of these countries like Nepal, Bhutan, and to a large extent India also their, their future is dependent on uh, securing energy sources from hydropower. But what's happening because of the glacier retreat and its impact on water resources is that this resource, which we took for granted, is becoming very uncertain. So clearly, hydropower, which is supposed to fuel economic growth, become a source of clean energy for the South Asia region, is in great jeopardy because of melting glaciers. And as we all know, uh, uh, the, the, although the, the Himalayan peaks are so beautiful and then they used to attract so many tourists, they used to also generate a lot of jobs for the local population. Uh, but then uh, what's happening, of course, is as we start to see more and more uh, disasters happening in the Himalayas, uh, the, the, the tourist, tourism also is being adversely impacted, especially in countries like Nepal, which in turn also is ha having an impact on the local economy in terms of jobs and, and so on and so on. So, uh, while those are kind of some of the negative aspects of, of the glacier melt uh, that we saw, we're also seeing some positive news. Uh, this is uh, a story from Ladakh where people have actually started constructing this, uh, you can say, ice stupas that they call glacier mountains uh, and, and basically since the, the the glacier retreat is having an impact on the water resources what they have done is they have started storing their rainwater uh, uh, when they get it and then creating these glacier mountains which they use when they need more water so clearly there are people are adapting to this uh, new normal as we can say especially in the mountainous areas mountainous communities where they used to depend so much and or continue to depend so much on a glacier as a major source of water, food, and livelihoods. So why, why are these glaciers as, so important? As I mentioned before, uh, they have huge implications for the region. Uh, but, they, but overall, when you look at the glaciers, this is the of Himalayas, they are like the biggest mass of ice beyond the, the poles. So that's why they are also called as the third pole. They stretch across these six or seven countries. They, con they contain 14 of the world's highest mountains. And, and also they are also called the, the water tower of this, uh, Asia, given uh, being a source of the 10 major river systems. So they have huge implications for the economies for the people of the South Asia region. Now, one of the things that we have seen in the last 50 years or so is that the temperatures have been gradually increasing in the region. In other words, the climate change is happening at, and it's real. Uh, for example, some areas, it's, uh, the temperature have gone up 
uh, by almost and on average about two degrees. In some areas, it's been one and 1.5 degrees as well. So temperatures are, are increasing gradually uh, in this part of the world for the last 50 years. Although we don't see so much of uh, change in the, the, the in the rainfall patterns as you see in the map on the right hand side. But if you look to the future, uh, most projections, climate uh, models show that the temperatures are going to further increase. And, and by 2050, as you can see here on the right hand side of the map, there could be an increase of up to 2 to 2.5 degrees, or even up to 3 degree increase in many uh, parts of South Asia, especially in a scenario where countries don't take any action to deal with climate change as we, we are uh, seeing right now. If the countries do take action to uh, uh, deal with climate change as they had agreed under the Paris Agreement, we we'll see uh, less of an impact as you see in the map on the left hand side. So clearly, uh, the temperatures have been increasing and uh, temperatures are going to continue to increase in the near future. So clearly this has huge implications for uh, glacier and snow melt in the Himalayas. So if you look at the last uh, 100, or, 100 or years, you will see that various studies have shown that the glaciers are, are receding. And one of the, one of the main indicators of, of uh, the glacier you can say the, 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 the glacier's uh, impact is, is, a, is a measure called glacier mass balance. And clearly, as you can see here, the glacier mass balance have been increasing over the, uh, decreasing over the years in the Himalayas, and especially in the last 50 years or so. So to a, to a large extent, this could be attributed to human activities, uh, although the glaciers overall uh, are declining because of, uh, of course, the, the warming uh, overall uh, warming of the temperatures, but I think to some extent this uh, the glacier uh, the, the loss of mass balance of glaciers could be attributed to a large extent to human activities. And also, as I mentioned before, we are also seeing that the glacier lakes are are being formed in increasing numbers, and clearly uh, the formation of glacier lakes in the Himalayas is also an indicator of the fact that the glaciers are melting and they are forming these glacial lakes, which eventually could burst and cause huge damage, both from an economic and human perspective. But a major source of uh, the glacier melt in the Himalayan region is uh, because of what's called as the black carbon. And studies have shown, that recent studies have shown that while climate change is having a major impact on the glaciers, but this, the whole glacier receding and, and, and glacier melt process is being accelerated because of black carbon. Now, what are these black carbon? Black carbon basically are these particles generated by, uh, let's say, pollu air pollution in the form of uh, burning of uh, 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 your agricultural crops or burning of forests or, or driving of diesel vehicles or, or brick kilns. So, the human activities that generate black carbon is having a huge impact on the glacier melt. And, the, and then the way the black carbon impacts glacier melt is that these particles generated by human activities, this, uh, they get deposited on the glaciers, which in turn reduces their reflective capacity and increases their absorptive capacity. And, and then that makes them lose their mass balance uh, uh, that's one as one way in which the black carbon impacts uh, glacier melt. The secondly, black carbon also, uh, when it circulates in the air, it generally warms the temperature, and then warming of temperature obviously leads to increasing uh, glacier melt. And finally, black carbon also has implications for our uh, precipitation patterns, rainfall patterns, and obviously uh, a reduced snowfall uh, in the mountain areas because of the black carbon also reduces. The, the intake of snow and, and therefore leads to uh, receding of glaciers. So overall, the recent evidence suggests that more than the, the, the changing climate that's been happening over the centuries, the, the human-induced human black carbon actually is a major cause of uh, glacier melt. 
Now, why uh, it's important to look at black carbon as a major source of glacier melt is because this is something under our control in the sense that obviously the global climate change is something that's happening, but it depends on the action of many countries, including, for example, uh, countries like the United States, China, and, and countries in Europe. Uh, and it calls for a much larger collaboration, uh, cooperation of countries. But black carbon is something that countries of South Asia themselves can control in terms of, for example, switching to more efficient uh, cooking, cooking stoves, cleaner cook stoves, maybe making their brick kilns more efficient, uh, switching away from diesel vehicles, reducing the burning of agricultural waste or, or reducing the forest uh, fires and so on and so forth. So clearly, uh, if the countries of the South Asia region want to reduce the, uh, or the glacier retreat, uh, limit the glacier retreat, then black carbon, I guess the policies to reduce black carbon as it becomes quite important. As you can see here, it comes from residential biofuel, it comes from coal cooking, it co comes from diesel vehicles, uh, it comes from uh, obviously factories, power plants, uh, and, and opal, open burning of agriculture. So clearly, these are some of the things that can be controlled. And also, one of the benefits of controlling black carbon, of course, is that it comes with huge health benefits. For example, as, as we all know, these pollution particles uh, uh, have huge implications in terms of human health. Uh, uh, and, and so you, you're not only by reducing uh, the glacier, you're not only impacting the glaciers, but also uh, you get a huge co-benefit in terms of uh, the, the, the human health impacts of, of reducing black carbon. So what I'm going to show you today or present today is, is a recent study that we did pretty much focusing on the impact of black carbon on, on glacier melt or, or, and the implications of that for water resources in the South Asia region. So we looked at the impact of black carbon on the entire Hindu Kush Himalayan Karakoram range, which is kind of, that's why it's called HKHK. And, 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 and basically this is pretty much stretches across the huge, the whole Himalayas across these seven countries. And then it's a main source of water for most of the region, and especially for the three major river basins that we know of, the Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Indus. So we, our study area basically includes three major river basins, the Indus, and uh, the Ganges, and, and Brahmaputra. All these, the, the three, uh, the hydrology of the three basins, of course, is quite uh, different, as you can see in the table. Uh, some, for example, uh, both, well, Indus and Brahmaputra have larger extensive uh, upstream areas. You can see that the Ganges and Brahmaputra are generally wetter, they get more rainfall. Indus, of course, is, is a larger irrigated area. So we see here, that, uh, uh, that the hydrology is different. So the impact of the glacier melt, snow melt, is going to be very different in these three different basins. So that's what makes our study interesting in the sense that we want to see how uh, the, the black carbon will uh, impact the glacier melt, snow melt in these three basins and how it's going to impact the downstream uh, water resources. And as you can see here, we really were interested in three major factors uh, which are impacted by uh, the black carbon. One is the glacier melt, of course. The second is snow melt. And the third is precipitation. Because all these three factors, they contribute to the downstream water resources in these basins. So at the end of the day, the water uh, flow that you get in the three basins is a function of snow melt glacier melt and precipitation. And all these three factors could be impacted by black carbon in the sense that increased black carbon will, will kind of accelerate glacier melt and some extent snow melt. And also, uh, it also plays havoc with the precipitation patterns. So that's what it makes it more interesting to see how the black 
carbon deposition impacts three, three, these three factors, how then it, how the, it leads to uh, then impact on, on, on downstream water resources in the three major river basins, which, which is home to uh, millions of people, or in fact, billions of people. So the, the analysis was basically threefold. We have to take into account climate change that's happening. Uh, we need to take into account uh, the black carbon that's being generated. And then uh, we also need to take into account uh, the topography of the region uh, in, in, in terms of obviously, in terms of the elevation, in terms of uh, the location of these uh, the upstream areas, downstream areas, and so on and so forth. So we developed this kind of modeling framework uh, where we basically developed a, a model which would then take into account the inputs from uh, the climate change models, inputs from a black carbon analysis that we did, and also uh, overlay that on top of uh, uh, topography and, 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 and the actual locations, and then generate the, the impact, the hydrology impact in terms of how the hydrology will change because of these uh, factors. And, and then from that, we can assess how all these factors will come into play in terms of their impact on, on the water resources downstream. And as we as I said before, water resources downstream have huge implications for how we are going to generate hydropower in the near future, how you are going to uh, uh, use water resources for your agriculture and other, other uses, how the disasters are going to be impacted, especially in terms of the glacial lake, formation of glacial lakes and so on and so forth. So again, whenever you uh, develop these type of models, I think the most important thing uh, is, of course, you need to make sure that you calibrate the model in such a way that it's actually it's able to uh, demonstrate the validity for, for the historical period. So that was the first thing that we did, that we made sure that the model projections for the historic period, period are consistent with what's uh, the, the available data uh, that we have. And then once uh, we calibrate the model and, and validate the model for the historic period, then the next step, of course, is to start making future projections. So what we did was we calibrated the model for climate change impacts, black carbon impacts, and tried to assess how the model works for, for the current period of, uh, or the historic period. And then we tried to make projections based on the future climate projections and, and various black carbon scenarios. And uh, so when we did this uh, calibration and validation exercise, of course, the first thing, of course, we need to see is how does this compare with other studies? Obviously, the time periods of the existing studies were different from ours, the methodologies were different, but more or less, uh, we, we just comforting to know that we were not to totally off the mark in terms of our projections uh, of runoffs compared to the other studies uh, that are already out there. So that's one of the ma test, major tests of any model that you kind of, uh, uh, you develop to make sure that it actually is consistent with what is out there in the literature. And then uh, the other thing that we could do, uh, of course, was see how the black carbon and climate change impacts uh, both glacial melt and snow melt. And, and it, this is interesting because a lot of times people confuse glaciers with snow. I think these are two different things. Uh, uh, so we, one of the things that we did in the model was to separate out uh, the implications for glacial melt and, and, and compared to uh, the snow melt in the Himalayan region. And, and overall, uh, as I said before, the focus was on how uh, the glacier melt, snow melt, and precipitation patterns in, uh, are impacted by black carbon and how that will then impact the, the flow uh, of uh, water uh, across these various three, the, the, the three major basins uh, in the Himalayan region. So our main kind of goal was to 
what we call as water production, how water production will be, uh, is being impacted by these three factors and how that will uh, be changed in the future. So again, as I said before, our main interest was in studying black carbon uh, and how black carbon, uh, and, and as I said before, the reason why we wanted to study black carbon is because black carbon or the policies to change black carbon are within our hands. For example, uh, switching from dirtier to cleaner cookstoves uh, or reducing the usage of diesel vehicles, making our brick kilns more efficient uh, or, or reducing uh, or switching away from coal-fired power plants or, or, or industrial activities. So these are some things that the region uh, could do uh, by itself without needing any support from outside. Because if you really uh, think in terms of the bigger climate change aspects, obviously it, it needs a much larger cooperation of many, many countries in the region. But the black carbon uh, policies can be enact enacted within the region and actually can be enacted in collaboration across the various countries of the South Asia region. So, uh, and that's what uh, we, we, we thought uh, we would study in terms of uh, how, if the countries actually implement policies to control black carbon, uh, in addition to what they're already doing, uh, what will be the impact of that, those policies on glacier melt, snow melt, precipitation patterns, and then ultimately on water production or, or downstream water resources impact. So we look at two scenarios. One is what we call as the standard case, in other words, the countries don't do anything extraordinary to control black carbon, but they continue with what they're doing in terms of, for example, uh, in India, there's this huge program uh, of switching people to LPGs. Uh, and in Nepal, too, there's now a huge you know, clean cook stove program. In Bangladesh, there's a program uh, to, to improve the effectiveness or efficiency of brick cleans and so on and so forth. Uh, but then we said, look, that's okay, but then what if countries want to be more ambitious in terms of phasing out diesel vehicles, in terms of reducing uh, uh, or, or, or moving away from coal-fired power plants, factories, uh, switching uh, in a big way towards cleaner cookstoves, uh, reducing their forest fires, agricultural residue burning, and so on and so forth. So what if actually countries do take major aspects? And that was a major, the, uh, thing that we want to study in terms of what we call as the standard case, which is, you can say, business as usual versus the mitigation case is when countries actively try to reduce their black carbon uh, production. Uh, and then we wanted to study how that's going to impact glacier melt, snow melt, and rainfall patterns, and then how that will impact uh, the runoffs uh, between now and 2040. And we see, of, of course, that uh, the, the, the mitigation scenario will obviously, uh, the, the runoffs are considerably reduced, mainly because the glacier melt is considerably reduced because of, of uh, the, the black carbon mitigation policy. So that's the kind of the major finding of this research is that if countries actually take action to reduce black carbon, then, the, then that will have significant impact on glacier melt and that will also have significant impact on, uh, on the flow of water resources. So the, the interesting finding, uh, I would say, is that uh, in the region right now, people talk of uh, air pollution separately from water. But what we are saying is that the your future of your water resources in the region actually is dependent on how you manage your air pollution. And, and, and unless you try to manage your air pollution uh, by containing these sources of black carbon, uh, it's going to have huge implications for your water resources. For example, uh, uncontrolled black carbon deposition is going to increase uh, future, uh, uh, in increase the glacier retreat. And, and, and so at some point, uh, there's going to be excess water that you need to manage. So, it's a trade-off between you know, whether you manage your air pollution, which also comes with huge benefits in terms of health benefits and so on and so forth, and also in terms of 
uh, the future impact on water resources. So again, we basically compare the mitigation scenario with the standard case and see how that impacts glacier melt, snow melt, and uh, how they contribute to the runoffs. So what are the major findings of this kind of uh, research that we are doing? Is that South Asian countries can reduce the black carbon deposition by 20% if the current policies are being followed, but then actually they can reduce it by further by 50% by enacting much more proactive policies uh, in order to cut, uh, contain black carbon. And that will have huge implications for glacier melt and then that impact of that on water resources in the Ganges, Brahmaputra and Indus basins. And we, we kind of also show that it is feasible for the countries of the South Asia region to reduce black carbon emissions with existing technologies uh, and, and resources. In other words, you don't need any new technology to come up in terms of, for example, uh, cleaner cook stove models exist, uh, cleaner technologies for uh, brick cleans exist. Uh, countries can uh, willingly move away from uh, coal-fired power plants or, or other coal-generated uh, production activities uh, and can reduce forest fires. So this is some, these are some of the things that they can, measures that they can take, and they are not going to be awfully expensive or, or, and they are going to be technically and economically feasible. So overall, uh, again, as I said, melting glaciers pose significant risks. Uh, you don't want more uh, cumix happening uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, not, not only many, many mountain communities are, are at great, great risk. Uh, the ones that depend on glacier, glaciated water for their uh, sustenance, but also huge impacts for downstream communities in terms of agriculture, in terms of hydropower, in terms of natural disasters, and so on and so forth. And what we are trying to argue in this uh, research is that uh, the glacier melt is also, uh, to a large extent, could be attributed to a generation of black carbon, and, and the controlling of black carbon is very much within the hands of the countries of the South Asia region. Uh, Again, uh, what we're trying to argue here is that uh, right now, uh, although the glacier melt is a regional challenge in the South Asia region, but the countries are not cooperating. In other words, uh, it's even more important that given that these, uh, that these river basins cut across countries at, uh, and the, the impact population across countries, I think it's important that uh, control, um, managing glaciers should become a regional cooperation agenda across countries because countries alone, working alone, cannot do much in this area. And again, uh, controlling of black carbon, we, we see is as critical in terms of uh, reducing uh, the risks, future risks from glaciers. And then, as I said before, uh, this recognition that water, future water resources will also depend on your current policies to cur curtail air pollution, that needs to be recognized and acted upon. And in terms of, again, uh, what, what steps can countries take? Obviously, uh, transition to cleaner cook stove that's been happening very slowly. It's unfortunate that even in the year 2020, almost 70% of the population in the region is still using biomass for cooking, which is uh, not good. Similarly, brick kilns, they, they are a huge uh, source of black carbon that could actually be, there are technologies that exist to switch brick kilns to uh, kind of to make them cleaner. Again, we need to come up with policies to protect these mountain communities like Cumic that are increasingly in danger from the glacier retreat. We need to see how they can be relocated or, or, or in other words, how, how can we protect them from these impending risks of glacier and uh, uh, retreat. Uh, glacier lake uh, are, forming, are being formed in increasing numbers. We need to monitor them closely because obviously they will uh, have huge impact, especially this, if the glacier lakes burst, then obviously yeah, they pose a huge threat to the downstream, not only in terms of uh, the infrastructure, but also uh, people. 
and also especially if South Asia region wants to manage uh, uh, its economies to generating hydropower, uh, clearly this is uh, now uh, an alarm bell because obviously the future generation of hydropower depends a lot on how you manage your glacier resources. I will stop you. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mani, sir. First, it's Kostav Das here from Amity University, Mumbai. And first of all, I would actually like to take this opportunity to thank you for sharing your views on an issue uh, regarding which there is not much discussion among us. And this is an issue that cannot be allowed to deteriorate. And sir, uh, I would also like to like to say that uh, that whatever I have come to know from your presentation here, one thing is quite clear that the issue of Himalaya is here. It is just a small symptom to a bigger problem, which is the negative effects of the climate change. And in my opinion, many of these things are happening because, as you said, many of the countries are not following the sustainable development growth model. So, sir, I would like to drive our discussion towards that, that direction by asking this question that, sir, as a country, India has uh, set up high targets when it comes to the sustainable development goals. And this has come into prominence, especially after the ratification of the Paris Agreement. But, sir, in your opinion, do you think that will we actually be able to uh, attain those targets? given the fact that even the existing existing policies related to the environment protection or conservation have not been efficiently implemented. Uh, Dr. Mani, I would like to add to that question that uh, when you looked at the data, um, as Kausub is saying, uh, do you see that the current policies are making any difference whatsoever as far as the carbon total carbon emissions for India is concerned. Thanks uh, for, uh, I think both are very good questions. Uh, clearly the current policies, although uh, uh, big strides are being made in India in terms of uh, uh, solar and, and, and other cleaner sources of energy, but still coal continues to be a mainstay of our power generation. Uh, and so to that extent, coal continues to be uh, the mainstay of our power generation. Obviously, the carbon emissions will continue to increase. India, I think, is number, number three in the globally in terms of uh, generating uh, greenhouse gas emissions. I don't think they have any target. Like, for example, even China recently announced that it's going to uh, go towards net zero carbon emissions by 2060. So I think India need to have some kind of a target uh, of becoming uh, kind of net zero carbon emissions, let's say maybe 2050 or 2047, and then work towards it. Because right now, as we see it, I think clearly as long as coal continues to be a major source of power, uh, our uh, generating electricity, uh, and, uh, and I think it's going to be, you know, it's difficult for India to manage its carbon emissions. And also, as you know, uh, air pollution is a major problem. I mean, if you take any statistics, uh, 18 of the 20 most polluted cities uh, in the world are in India. Right? So, so clearly, uh, I think managing air pollution and, and managing uh, carbon emissions, they go hand in hand together because the sources generating both air pollution and carbon emissions are the same. Your diesel vehicles, your factories, your power plants, your household burning and so on and so forth. And also, uh, Alka, as I mentioned, uh, this whole uh, thing of, you know, 70% of the population still using biomass for cooking. It's so unhealthy, especially for women and children. And it's kind of, uh, it's sad that even in the year 2020, we are talking about, you know, people using very traditional uh, sources of cooking, which were used thousands of years ago, right? Uh, although I think uh, the, the LPG program is making, uh, I think, uh, is doing, having some impact. Uh, so on that, uh, what's happening, again, uh, the interesting anecdote is that, uh, for example, in Nepal, they have a huge clean cook stove program. And they, they started distributing, you know, solar cook stoves and other clean cook stoves. But what seems to be happening is that people use their clean cook stoves for six months, and then they go back to switching it back to their older uh, you know, traditional cook stoves, they they say either because the food doesn't taste the same in, in the cleaner cook stoves, that's one excuse, or something goes wrong with the clean cook stoves and they're not able to fix it and so on and so forth. So I think a lot of it is also 
uh, behavioral change that we need that needs to come people has to have to start accepting the fact that you know they have to switch away from the traditional uh, cooking methods to cleaner cooking methods uh, thank you sir i'll be taking this uh, another question to you sir that so if as you rightly mentioned about the efforts that needs to be taken by the south asian countries to tackle the climate change issue so one thing in my personal opinion what i have observed that when it comes to education in south asian countries the education policy in those countries is such that the citizens there from a very ten- tender age are actually given a knowledge of just economic prosperity without and uh, not considering the fact that how it will affect the environmental factor as well as the ethical factor in order seeing the present situation now and in order to tackle seeing the urgency of the situation does need this approach need to change from just economic prosperity to economic prosperity and environmental sustainability in order to uh, tackle the climate change issue yeah i mean definitely uh, the current model of economic prosperity doesn't bode well for the environment and our future sustainability of the planet and of, of course uh, the country we are losing forests at an alarming rate people are uh, increasingly being affected by air pollution so clearly we are seeing that that the impacts of the economic progress on environment is not good the waterways are polluted and so on and so forth so i think it's high time country the, the people recognize that environmental sustainability should go hand in hand with economic prosperity uh, and and clearly that test needs to come through education uh, very very early on i think uh, uh, schools should have courses that talk about environmental sustainability uh, cleaner living sources of living uh, of cleaner sources of production and, and and so on and so forth so i think that's really educating people is important because as i said because that also will lead to uh, behavioral change i think that's that's very critical in terms of how we change our ways you know in terms of uh, uh, for example reducing our driving of you know cars that because obviously uh, transportation is a huge cost uh, to the environment uh, similarly we each one of us can reduce our carbon footprint in some ways and that has to come from uh, education the, I, i think uh, people should shy away from the traditional kind of uh, lifestyles that have actually gotten us into this problem because we are not very far away from tipping points right covid has demonstrated that what uh, 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 this type of disruption can cause uh, to the economies to the people and, and so on and so forth so this should be a lesson for us in the sense that what climate change could bring could be very similar to the disruption from climate change or climate induced events could be as bad as covid so clearly i think this should be a kind of a wake up call for us to actually start doing something about it uh, thank you sir my next question is sir as you rightly pointed out that the himalayan re- region himalayan ranges cu- currently are going through a lot of pro- problems and what it is how it is impacting on the local population there so i in ma- there have been many organizations that have been trying to tackle this issue issue by making some efforts but so when it comes to tackling this issue and supporting these organizations one of the main things that these organizations are Uh, having an obstacle is that they are not getting enough support from the business community or even the normal the common citizens community and i think this has impacted a lot so when in in such kind of scenario how, how does organizations such as world bank or other international organizations are helping them because definitely by vi- financial viability is something that even the organizations have to think about thanks uh, so yeah one way with the world bank we try to uh, i guess uh, we, but through this type of research activities we try to uh, kind of uh, bring this knowledge uh, to the forefront so it's more like an advocacy on our part uh, but also uh, we would like to also we also of course world bank also provides loans uh, for countries but right now most of the loans that countries are willing to borrow from the world bank are for projects like construction of roads power plants and and so on and so forth uh, and, and and many countries they feel that uh, they don't feel the need to borrow to deal with climate change and and, and uh, on one hand they feel that because the climate change is not 
caused by them which comes coming from elsewhere so they don't need to do anything about it uh, but in terms of the smaller organizations like ngos i guess you're talking about the ngos i mean a lot of ngos are very active in in the himalayan region but then uh, as you rightly said they they work with uh, very limited resources and and clearly i think uh, there has to be more awareness uh, uh, and and also support from the private sector foundations and so on and so on and so forth uh, and i think just like uh, the swachh bharat abhiyan i think we need a mission approach to deal with climate change and and glacier melt and, and that has to come again uh, from the top Uh, thank you so much sir uh, with this i would like to request shubham to please carry forward with the audience question answer round shubham over to you uh, thank you kausal uh, just first one of... moment shubham sure ma'am uh, shubham before you start i just want to say some things so just wait for a minute sure ma'am yeah okay uh, so there are certain things that i just want uh, you all to know about and to point out that uh, the reason why i decided to call dr mani is because uh, as far as not just climate tech change but even in general uh, resource economics and environmental economics or even as far as the students of uh, politics are concerned the political pacts that take place in climate remember one thing it's all extremely model based nobody speaks anything in air as far as this particular party is concerned and i just wanted to actually demonstrate it by calling someone who is at the world level talking about these things so that you understand and the thing is that uh, he of course did not go into the details of how extremely complicated these models are and he did not even uh, get into the entire huge analysis that these people go into to prove how things are happening as far as climate change is concerned but just a little glimpse of it should let you understand that any time that you talk of anything in today's world it is very important to prove it and he proved it by the data by the model that he had and that is something which is very important for us in india to know and understand about because indians are still not that much rigorous when it comes to proving things or doing research maybe we as in our generation might not have done that all that well but i hope that as far as your generation is concerned you would pick up whatever is being done in the institutions like world bank so that was one thing which was a take away point for all the people who are the students over here that just see how much they study before they speak anything okay so that was one thing now the second thing uh, which uh, uh, money i wanted to ask you was that that um, you talked about this impact of the black carbon and uh, uh, you were saying something about the glaciers receding by some i mean the runoff increasing by 2 or 3 percent as far as the receding of glaciers was concerned and then there was some second column where you said that that is increasing by 10 to 12 percent i forget what the second column was um, so what i wanted to ask you was that that the present state that we are in and the uh, generation that we are facing right now the students who are of say 19 or 20 years old uh, when they become my age which is about 50 would they be able to see a ganga oh that's a very good point uh, alka i think yes uh, as i said before we are close to a tipping point and we need to do something right now i, I think uh, if we wait too long that as you rightly said you know 20 30 years from now we don't know whether it will uh, the, the flow in the ganga will be as much as what we have today or or in any of the other uh, rivers uh, especially if we lose all the glaciers so the action needs to be taken today and also i i also agree with your first point in terms of uh, uh, science driven policy which is unfortunately missing 
from the world right now. Even in case of COVID, uh, in the US, as you can see here, we have a president who doesn't believe in science and we are in a very bad situation with regard to uh, COVID impact. So I think it's really important that students, they should rec recognize that when you formulate a policy, it has to be rigorously kind of tested and it has to be in, uh, informed through scientific evidence and especially in the area of climate change where there are so many uncertainties. So I think, and as we do more research, we become more certain about the consequences. But broadly, I think there is now a consensus that some of the actions that we take today, be it you know, use, uh, generating power from coal-fired power plants, clearly there is a uh, kind of a consensus that, that, that those things have to change. And, and then there's a bigger issue which we have to address, of course, is uh, there's a huge uh, kind of say subsidy culture in our, in our yeah. country. You know, you, you are the, the, uh, if you're a farmer, you get a free electricity, you get free water, uh, subsidized fertilizer, seeds, and then the government is willing to buy back your product. So you have no incentive to adapt to climate change, no incentive right. to innovate, no incentive to become more efficient. And, and that has to change. And all these subsidies that the government gives doesn't come at uh, no cost. I mean, it's all costing, uh, fiscally, it's a huge impact on the governments, on the, both on the central government and also on the state governments. So unless those kind of uh, uh, policies change, I think it's going to be very difficult for us to move towards you know, uh, more sustainable ways of producing and consuming things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Shubham, now you can go on. Yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Mani. It's, it was a very enlightening talk indeed. As Altham had mentioned, uh, climate change is a topic uh, that really needs the attention of the hour, especially for the young of this country who will be, as Altham pointed out, whether or not there is a question mark, whether or not we'll be able to see the Ganges in a few years' time. So I would like to thank you for uh, putting this uh, issue out and bringing a lot of facts to light which are missing in today's world where we have so much information available yet there is uh, so little of the facts that we have uh, to talk about. I just had one question from my end. Um, if we look at the situation in developing countries, the political executives are in a dilemma whether to follow the industrialized form of development where they'll be, uh, you know, which will yield instant results or follow the sustainable development model, which will, you know, uh, which might be costly initially, but one can see the results of them in the long run. So how can those countries fulfill their sustainable development goals in line with the electoral obligations that the political executives have to face? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. I think uh, it's high time we all realize that, uh, that the Western model of development doesn't work anymore uh, and that's not sustainable. So I think it makes much more sense for countries to actually uh, follow a more sustainable development and growth paradigm as opposed to following what the Western countries did. And, 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 and as we can see here, uh, it has huge impacts not only for the future, but also even, even now, for example, the air pollution, the problem that we are facing in our country is something that's um, because of our uh, uh, the, the uh, decisions that we take today, not something. So it's not something that's going to happen to us. Yes, the impact on the glaciers, the Ganges, maybe 50, 20, 20, 30 years from now. But even now, the polluted waterways. If you're going to go to, you know, take a bath in the Ganges, or, or if you drive through any major city in India. So, so I think the uh, for the policymakers. Uh, it is, of course, a difficult political economy problem. Uh, the moment they start talking about a carbon tax or water tax is going to be a major issue for them. You know. So uh, they have to walk this delicate kind of, kind of uh, line between uh, making sure that the policies that they are supporting doesn't become too too controversial, uh, and that's that's a, that's a, that's something. Uh, that's always there, I think. But I think what we need is to we need to educate the policymakers uh, to make them more aware of the benefits of these policies. For example, again, I would uh, give, take the example of you know, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan is one example, small example, where I think 
a uh, lot of things changed within a short period of time mainly because uh, of not only something push that came from the top but also uh, that was combined with a behavioral change across the a huge segment of the population so i think that's something that we need to uh, have uh, thank you sir i would now like to hand over to uh, sinhat sir Yes. Uh, yes. Before, uh, before that, that, I would like to yes, yes, I would like to invite Alka Ma'am only for uh, you know speaking few lines on the session and also uh, the lecture. No, uh, yes. more than that, I yes. uh, wanted to first ask because we have some faculty colleagues over here. So correct, correct. Uh, yes. Yeah. In case Dr. Hawaldar or Dr. Meera Limay or Dr. Pandu Rang or somebody wants to say something, Dr. Hawaldar, would you like to say something, please? No, no. Uh, it's fine, ma'am. No question. Actually, I, I, I think you would not agree what the suggestion that which he has given about the subsidy of agriculture, agriculture subsidy. Um, so that is the thing. So I, I don't think so that people in the country will agree to that. Yeah. To resolve. The Because in not only in India, in other countries, European countries also give the subsidies to the farmers. Not in only India. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah, that's true. Um, I think yeah, so that is your your expertise in that subject. So I should not talk on that. But I had this only had some yeah, say, raise the doubt about this. Yeah. That that is slightly larger debate. So I think that right now I would not go into that. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a the, just as the students have been talking about, and uh, uh, we all know that these are the questions which are not very easy choices. And uh, but the thing is that it's important to hear to people like Dr. Mani in between to remember that not to have a single strong policy to fight with the kind of pollution that we are creating is something which is going to kill us one day. and that is something which we keep forgetting unless somebody like him comes with this huge evidence and he puts it on your head and he says hey now look look what is going to happen to you and then you realize that maybe we are making some mistakes and we need to think about this far more than as a nation we have been thinking about so yes i agree professor hawalda that we have difficult choices but we need to think about i mean i think this is the kind of message that we get from his talk don't you agree yes yes and it was a very good excellent lecture yes yes um, yes i must congratulate him and yeah. dr siddharth and dr to you also ma'am yeah yeah so dr siddharth now the yes, floor sir. is yours uh yes thank you so much ma'am uh, before i start with the vote of thanks sir i also have one or two questions from my end you know it was really a intriguing session for all of us for all our faculty members and students present here and uh, especially a lot of insights came out of your presentation i would say i had one particular question in context of uh, policy formulation in uh, in consideration of uh, developing nations you know you see a lot of uh, times when the policy formulation is taking place uh, the policy experts that are involved in the process of policy formulation and not taken into much serious deliberation when it comes to technical aspects of policy formulation like environmental policies so how much of that is affecting uh, the context of environmental change impact which is happening with regards to the climate change that's one and the second is that uh, a lot of environmental activists in current scenario are raising concerns about climate change issue like we saw in the last year greta thunberg who spoke in the international forum but we didn't see a much of the impact from the you know political leaders or on that very uh, talk of her you know so how much of uh, concentrated effort by international organizations like world bank and others to build up some kind of a pressure on political leader you did mention about the kind of work the international organizations are doing but i wanted to understand how much of a pressure is trying to be built up in form of some kind of a sustainable measures that could be taken by the political leaders like Uh, from russia usa china likewise uh thanks thanks to that uh unfortunately uh, with the world bank we don't have much 
control over what uh, the politicians, be it the Western uh, countries or, or in the developing countries. Uh, but what we do try to do is we put out our uh, research out there. Uh, we try to, you know, uh, advocate for certain policies uh, and, and, and then we hope that that sticks. And, and, and that's unfortunately, in most cases, it doesn't stick. Uh, we had the only hope, uh, to be frank with you, for us in the U.S., we are hoping that if uh, Donald Trump doesn't get elected, that will be a huge... <laughs> I don't see that happening. That will be a huge win for the uh, That will be a huge win for environment and climate change because clearly one of the biggest uh, stumbling blocks for global climate change has been the United States and its policies and hope that if there is a Biden administration that will be very pro-climate and pro-environment and that could, if the U.S. can take leadership, I think that would change, that could change a lot of things uh, around the world. Yeah. So, so, yeah, again, coming back to your question, yes, we, we do our best in terms of influencing policies through our programs in countries, but at the end of the day, we cannot influence politicians themselves. Mm -hmm. Right, sir. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, with this, I would like to conclude the session. I would like to thank Dr. Mani, sir, for taking out time from his busy schedule and giving us such an insightful lecture on uh, the climate change issue and receding Himalayan glacier, which is a growing concern in contemporary political scenario, especially from a global politics concern, as well as for the emerging countries, developing countries, and the developed nations as well. And especially for the younger generation, it is a troubling concern at this moment if we are not taking immediate measures towards sustainable growth and development, and we are not implying by certain uh, immediate measures to incorporate environmental concerns. We are so going to see a very troubling times in the near future. Uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Anka Parik, ma'am, for making this uh, session possible for all of us and taking out time from Dr. Mani sir and getting him for us to listen to this such a great session. To my students, Kostu, Shubham, Akeb for uh, doing such a wonderful job today. And to all the students and faculties present here, Dr. Hamalda sir, Pandurang sir, Dr. Nandini and uh, several others. Dr. Meera ma'am is also present here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. And we hope to see you again Hope to hear from you again sometime in near future uh, in similar kind of session. Thank you. Yeah, sir. I want to add to that saying that uh, this was a session which was meant for meant for climate change, but uh, and it was a webinar. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we might like to uh, invite you one day for some lecture where you can teach our students how to do these models and how to do at least the simple models so that they understand how these things are done in fact, and in how fact, these things are done scientifically. In fact, to cut you short, ma'am, I'm teaching a, a public policy paper. In fact, I would like to request you to do some uh, short lectures for our students <laughs> sometime in the near future. <laughs> that would be really great. <laughs> yeah, at least at least some insights into these things because, correct, uh, correct. you know, I mean, uh, the, you would not have to give like a full course or something, but at the same time to have a lecture recorded, which might be of say even just 15 or 20 minutes, which gives some insights into, as I said, how the models are built or how certain things are done, you know? I mean, uh, some technical aspects which are important and vital to know about. And uh, we will put it up even for the public. It does not need to be just for our own students, but uh, it is something which would be very useful because as I said, uh, it is not done with so much rigor in India as it is in World Bank. It is done in certain places in India, but World Bank, it is done always like that. And that is the reason why we can learn a lot from World Bank in that sense. And you are one of the leading uh, economists over there. So it would be really nice if we can collaborate some other time when you have time on this also. Thanks. Thanks very much, Alka. Thanks, that. Yes, I mean, I, I didn't make the presentation too technical. Uh, yeah. Either, either because out of practice in the World Bank, we do extremely technical research, but then when we are presenting some of the things, we try to make it less technical because usually our audience is policymakers. So maybe 
out of habit that had, was the had, that was the best part about your presentation that was so <laughs> simple that we could understand yeah. for us layman's understanding right but if you want a technical presentation obviously i'm i'm game i will definitely you know yeah a very simple from. one that only the first year students first year graduate students can also oh, yeah. understand but something which will be kind of you know a slight insightful thing for them and a peep into that kind of a world that's the thing definitely yeah. definitely yeah yeah we'll think about it some other time yes yeah, sure. okay yeah but thanks a lot thank you very much thanks okay yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Uh, and uh, I forgot to mention Ashni, who had done the poster for this session. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And hope to see you in uh, near future. We'll be organizing more such sessions. So do tune in with us uh, sometime in near future. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.